want to thank Brother Gill for helping us in worship leadership this morning. I kind of like having all the children over there on that side of the balcony. We should talk about this maybe more often. We could do this. We turn our attention to the epistle reading for this first Sunday in Advent from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Some words that ring of the season of Advent and of the coming of Christ and of the nature of the church in this season. Paul writes, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Her name is Pat. Pat works in a large office of about a hundred people for a business that I think many of us know where every year December comes and there is the office Christmas party. Pat calls these parties the Jingle Bells circuit. And in a piece called Too Much Holly and Not Enough Holy, Pat shares that for years she found these seasonal office gatherings in December to be rather difficult. She had to decide, first of all, what to wear, which is another way to say, is this the same dress I wore last year? She had to decide when to arrive, to arrive on time or fashionably late. Which is to say, if I arrive on time, people will think I've got nothing better to do. And if I arrive late, they think I'm making a grand entrance. And of course, she had to decide how much to eat. She said, if I pick too daintily from a few things, people will say, what's wrong with the food? And if I stick my nose, these are her words, too deep in the trough, they will ask, doesn't she eat at home? <laughs> so Pat acknowledged that if she really thought about it, even if she did work closely with a few of the people likely to be at the party, she really didn't know many of the others very well at all. In fact, the interesting thing was that most of the people in the office sent Christmas cards to each other anyway wishing each other lots of personal happiness and joy. But they found that actually being together to celebrate the season had its challenges. So, one year Pat decided to go to the party with a new approach. At the party she knew she would see over two-thirds of the people whom she sent the cards to anyway so she went to each of them personally at the party and said, this year I'm giving you my personal greetings. She spent the evening in meaningful conversations. She spent the evening listening as well as talking. She told people that she appreciated them and that she hoped they would find a special peace for themselves in the weeks of Advent in the weeks that we prepare for Christmas. She shared with them that her plan this year was to be in the season rather than to do the season. 
And she discovered that along with herself, people longed to come together and be real people with each other, hoping that the season would bring something special, some kind of spark of good news of Christmas that might leap between them. When I read this wonderful epistle scripture this morning from 1 Thessalonians for the first Sunday in Advent, I couldn't help but think of Pat's discovery and her admonition to be in the season, not just do the season. And I think it's a worthy invitation and maybe an admonition for us at home church this year. St. Paul, of course, is writing to a fledgling church in Thessalonica, a church, according to Acts 17, that he had just started a few weeks before he wrote, a few months, rather, before he wrote this letter. When you read all of the letter, it's obvious how much the congregation is in Paul's thoughts and prayers. He says that he's tried to visit them again, but he's been unable to, and he's saddened by that. He is encouraged by the strength and the steadfastness of their faith, even though he knows they've been tested. He is thankful and joyful for them, he says. And he also wants to see them face to face, to be encouraging and nurturing of them and their growing faith in Christ. In his commentary on this letter, Carl Holliday writes that Paul's words capture the essence of what it means to prepare for the Lord's coming in the community of faith. The Thessalonians have received the word of God, not just the words of the preacher Paul, but the active, energizing word of God that is at work among them. God's presence is a powerful force in their community and it confirms their growing faith. Therefore, as Paul says, the community is bound to one another in love. And this becomes the center of God's activity. Paul prays that this love will grow and not be narcissistic, not turning in on itself and its own needs exclusively but rather abound, if you will, to the whole human race. And when this happens, the church that genuinely experiences the coming of Christ into its own midst most fully embodies that presence when it extends its love beyond itself and chooses to live for others. In short, the church becomes a living reenactment, if you will, of the Christ story, the story of love for others. So I pose the question to us, brothers and sisters of home church, who shall we be in this season? What will be central to our life together over the next few weeks of Advent as we prepare this year for the coming of Christ? Well, I think that we would do well to let Paul's words be our guide in at least two specific ways. First of all, let's be unceasing during this Advent in thanking God for the joy we feel because of each other. Let's pray earnestly as Paul invites the church every night and day I would sort of say when you get up in the morning and before you go to bed at night, that when we see each other face to face, that when we bring the joy of our fellowship and our relationships into this enfleshed community in Advent, that whatever is lacking in the faith of any brother or sister here might be restored. What a beautiful way to be in Advent, that thanksgiving and joy might bring faith and restoration. 
If you look around this room and you can't find someone to pray earnestly for, pray for me. <laughs> Please. Pray for all the wonderful leaders and teachers and servers in this congregation. Pray for our board members, our committees, our working groups, our gifted, gifted musicians, our community volunteers and leaders, our ushers, our deaners, our staff. Pray for our children, our youth, our older adults, and our families. Pray for all our members who can't be here physically anymore. Pray for all those who come to Candle Tea or to this sanctuary in a few weeks for our Christmas love feasts. Or even for those who walk down the streets of Salem in this season and they see that big Advent star hanging on the front of this church. They know something of its meaning, but they long desperately for its light. In our joy, let us be thankful for, another in, for one another in this season, in our prayers and in our life together. Secondly, let's be in this season as those who Paul invites to to abound in love for one another, strengthening our hearts in holiness so that we may be blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. In his book called The Compassionate God, Chon Sen Song writes these words. It is only love calling unto love, heart calling unto heart, that can break the curtains that separate human beings. It is in sparing no effort in building a communion of love that the future of humanity lies. This communion of love is the vision of God as God moves on in the fulfillment of the divine purpose in our human history. That is to live with us in life and in hope. My friends, we are blessed, blessed in our Moravian community to know that our love for each other and our love for Christ are at the center of our life together in this place. There is no other center. And they are certainly at the center of who we are and who we want to be in Advent. The particular invitation in Paul's words is that our love may abound. In my words, that our love may be broad and deep. You see, unlike this fledgling church in Thessalonica, we've been around a while. We've been at this Advent business about 240 times or so. So let me say this. This year, may our love sustain us where there is doubt or anxiety. May our love move us where there is need for acceptance and reconciliation. May our love lead us where there is lack of vision or hope. May our love fill us where there is hurt or grief. And may our love shine through us where there is darkness or fear. This abounding love, this broad and deep affection for Christ and for one another is what strengthens our hearts in the holiness of Advent. And I believe it is what prepares us for the amazing truth of God's love and grace in Christ that declares each of us blameless blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. You know, we don't have a staff Christmas party at home church. Maybe we should. I don't know. I'd have to decide what to wear. 
and what to bring and how to act. I'm a minister, you know. <laughs> but we do have a staff luncheon, a Christmas lunch that's brought to us during Advent, and we don't even prepare it. It's brought to us by some of our members. They say they're thinking of us, and they are thankful for us, and they love us. And we say to them, and to all of you, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel because, before God because of you? May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. This season, may your hearts be strengthened in holiness and your faith always restored. Brothers and sisters, it is the Advent season again, and so we wait in faithfulness and love for the coming of our Lord. Amen.